Ladies and gentlemen, greetings and welcome to the Rumble Inc. third quarter 2023 earnings conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A brief question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star and zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It is now my pleasure to introduce your host, Shannon Devine, Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you, Operator. I'm here today with Chris Pawlowski, Founder, Chairman, and CEO of Rumble, Brandon Alexandrov, the CFO, and Tyler Hughes, the COO. A press release detailing our third quarter 2023 results was released today and is available on the Investor Relations section of our company website. Before we begin the formal presentation, I would like to remind everyone that statements made on the call and webcast may include predictions, estimates, or other information that might be considered forward-looking. All forward-looking statements are made only as of the date of this webcast and should be considered in conjunction with the cautionary statements in our earnings release and the risk factors included in our filings with the SEC. Future company updates will be available via press releases and company updates via the company's identified social media channels. I will now turn the call over to Rumble's founder, chairman, and CEO, Chris Pavlovsky. Chris? Hello, and thank you for joining us today. The third quarter was strong for our business as we continue to deliver on our commitments to build our video and cloud platforms and get ready to scale monetization in 2024. First, I would like to highlight the cloud business, where we achieved our biggest milestone to date with the launch of the beta release of Rumble Cloud in September, ahead of schedule. As we have stated in the past, building our own infrastructure for Rumble's video platform is existential for our business. We can never rely on big tech cloud providers for hosting. Today, with a full build out of the infrastructure to support Rumble Video, we are in position to sell our excess capacity to the market through Rumble Cloud. The aim of Rumble Cloud is to provide cloud solutions to the growing segment of businesses who are disenfranchised with big tech cloud providers due to unfair pricing strategies and increasingly restrictive terms and conditions. Since we launched in September with minimal promotion, the response has been extremely encouraging with qualified leads spread out over many markets, led by entertainment, e-commerce, gaming, education, and telecommunications. We have already begun onboarding clients onto the platform where we will refine our product and continue to ramp onboarding over the coming months. Our goal is to collect as much feedback in the beta stage as possible and launch fully in the first half of 2024. Second, I'd like to touch on the progress we've made to our video platform, where our vision is to build the most attractive economic toolkit for creators on the internet. I'm very excited to share the integration of our recent acquisition of Rumble Studio. Previously, Colin, which closed in May, is now in beta. I believe this could be a game changer for Rumble and the creator community as a whole. It has the potential to not only transform the live streaming experience for our creators, but also become a critical component of driving creator sponsorship revenue at scale. From the live streaming perspective, Rumble Studio will be the new cockpit for creators where they will be able to seamlessly manage and customize their live stream production directly from the Rumble Studio application, control their distribution, and ultimately provide a world-class interactive experience for their audience. From the monetization perspective, Rumble Advertising Center will be directly integrated into Rumble Studio. Imagine having Rack present creator sponsorship offers in real time during streams and prior to going live on Rumble Studio, creators being able to elect to do the sponsorship within their stream. This is what gets our teams really excited and why I believe it could be a real game changer. These sponsorship offers will not only extend to the Rumble audience when going live, but since Rumble Studio will allow streaming to all platforms, our sponsorship marketplace can now extend into all live streaming platforms and all audiences, creating massive potential opportunity for this product. 
On our last earnings call, we mentioned that our creator sponsorships are currently facilitated by a manual sales process. Rumble Studio, integrated with Rack, will be the key for us to facilitate scaling this part of the business, enabling us to move from a small cohort of creators to potentially thousands of monetized creators overnight. We expect Rumble Studio to very quickly add value to our business, both by greatly reducing the friction to live stream on Rumble, which will bring more creators to the platform, and also by accelerating scaling for sponsorship revenue in the future. Looking back, over our first year as a public company, the capital raised in our public listing has enabled us to build out our content library and attract leading content creators, helping us successfully grow our diversified audience to 58 million monthly active users. Our content acquisition and diversification strategy has come at a calculated cost, but we believe our money has been well spent to date. In particular, our strategy should position us well to achieve our next goal relating to monetization initiatives, and that is attracting advertising agencies to our platform. Our momentum with advertising agencies, including top-tier brand and political agencies, stems largely from our relationships with sports leagues and the acquired talent in this field. The investments we have made to date position us to leverage these relationships with very clear runway ahead. Today, Rumble reaches a great variety of audiences, and according to Comscore, the industry standard for third-party digital audience tracking, political independents and those with no party affiliation are our largest segment, Democrats second and Republicans third. Let me repeat that. Independents and those with no party affiliation is our largest audience, uh, political audience segment. It's clear Rumble has entered a stage of diversification that caters to a diverse audience, allowing advertisers to reach desired audience segments on our platform. Importantly, the attraction of advertising agencies allows us to slow down our spending without affecting our revenue potential. If there is one takeaway from our third quarter, it is that Rumble is nearing the end of the building phase and is on schedule to scale monetization in 2024. We raised the necessary funds just over a year ago, have been diligent and strategic in our spending, and now have the creators and audience necessary to attract the attention of advertisers. To date, we've provided a small number of our creators with guaranteed minimum earnings because, of our adver because our advertising ecosystem did not match that of competing platforms. As our monetization engines, Rack and Rumble Studio, come online, creators will begin to see their earning opportunities significantly increase. This development enables us to pull back on our spending to acquire content while maintaining our creator and audience base. To crystallize this a bit further, by the end of 2024, we, ante we anticipate increased ad-driven monetization will allow us to attract new and retain existing creators with reduced reliance on guaranteed payments. With the aforementioned in place, we expect our guaranteed creator commitments to significantly decrease by the end of 2024, while our revenue engines come online, moving us materially towards break-even in 2025. The third quarter, also proves that we have created a community for everyone. We have proven that Rumble is the preeminent neutral platform, and the opportunity that we provide has never been more attractive. With that, I'll turn the call over to our CFO, Brandon Alexandrov. Thanks, Chris. I'll now take you through our Q3 financials at a very high level before turning the call over to the operator for Q&A. We reported revenues of $18 million for the quarter. This compares to $11 million for Q3 2022. The growth was primarily driven by a $2.3 million increase in advertising revenue and a $4.7 million increase in licensing and other revenue. The increase in advertising revenue was driven by an increase in consumption as well as the introduction of new advertising solutions for creators, publishers, and advertisers, including host red advertising and Rack both of which we started to build and test in the second half of 2022. While our revenue remains relatively small and subject to variability quarter over quarter, the progress made in attracting and retaining our audience, as well as the development of creator monetization tools, are proving out our overall business model and potential of the company. Our cost of services include all programming and content costs related to payments to content providers, including amounts paid to creators based on revenues generated, 
as well as additional costs related to incentivizing top creators to promote and join our platform. Cost of services also includes third-party service provider costs, such as data center and networking, staffing costs directly related to professional service fees, and costs paid to publishers. Cost of services for the quarter were $39.8 million compared to $12.3 million in Q3 a year ago. The increase was due to an increase in programming and content costs of $26.1 million, hosting expenses of $700,000, and other service costs of $700,000. Moving to our cash position, we ended the quarter with approximately $267 million in cash, cash equivalents, and marketable securities compared to $338.3 million as of December 31, 2022. To date, as intended, a large portion of our cash used has been to acquire content by providing economic incentives, including minimum guaranteed earnings, to a limited number of content creators, including sports leagues, which we have not yet begun to monetize meaningfully. This content acquisition strategy has allowed us to enter key content verticals and secure top content creators in those verticals before we have full monetization capabilities in place. And as Chris mentioned, we anticipate increased ad-driven monetization will allow us to attract new and retain existing creators with reduced reliance on guaranteed payments. As a result, we expect our guaranteed creator commitments to significantly decrease by the end of 2024 while our revenue engines come online, moving us materially towards break-even in 2025. That concludes my prepared remarks. Before I turn the call over to the operator, I invite you all to join Chris this evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Time in an exclusive post-earnings interview with Matt Kors to be streamed live on the Matt Kors Rumble channel. I will now turn the call over to the operator to open up the line for questions from our covering analysts. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star and 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star and 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while we poll for questions. Our first question comes from Tom Forte with D.A. Davidson. Please go ahead. Great, thanks. So I had several questions. I wanted to ask two and then get back in the queue and then ask the remainder. So, First off, can you provide your current thoughts on your ability to track influencers from other platforms, including Twitch? Uh, it looks like news came out today that Amazon had more layoffs in their gaming space, only this time it was not Twitch uh, specifically. That was my first question. Yes, yeah, so we've had a, a lot of success with uh, attracting creators from Twitch as of, I would say, earlier Q2 of, uh, of this year. And uh, we believe, you know, that momentum should, should be able to continue going into next year as these uh, other platforms have uh, exorbitant fees uh, with creators. So, for example, I believe the rev shares on, uh, on Twitch are, are very high um, in favor of Twitch, uh, whereas uh, a platform like Rumble is offering much more compelling rev shares, which should help attract uh, the, that creator base over to our platform. Great, and then for my second question, I'll get back in the queue. Uh, it looks like you've been the exclusive live streamer for numerous Republican presidential debates uh, with more kind of coming up. Have these been needle, needle movers as far as engagement goes? A absolutely. Um, when, it can't, when it comes to the, 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 the RNC, the Republican primary debates, the, the first debate uh, in particular that I can remember had over 700 across the platform at a single point in time with the, the GOP being the largest stream, we had over 700,000 concurrent uh, streamers, uh, watchers uh, on the platform according to stream charts. And I believe the GOP was the number one stream in the United States at the time that it happened happened. Uh, so we've seen some huge success on the, on, on the debates and, uh, you know, pushing our platform as well to, to, to really high, to very high marks. Great. I'll get back in the queue for more questions. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Jason Helstein with Oppenheimer and Company. Please go ahead. 
Thanks. Um, I'll ask a few. But first, I want to say, Joe, I watched the recent GOP debate on my phone on cellular on your app, and it was it was well done. So so kudos to that. Um, so so I guess we have a lot of stuff to unpack. So I'll ask a few, and then we'll keep taking turns. So um, at USMAU was up nicely quarter to quarter, but minutes kind of per user were down. I don't know. Any like general thoughts? behind that um, as far as like mix of content in the quarter? So that's question one. So I'll just go one at a time. Yeah, so when it comes to the engagement metric, um, there's a couple things there. First off is the is that we have, you know, in the summer when, when for example, we had the GO, GOP debate in the middle of the summer, a lot of creators not, not only in the summer are taking time off, so you're seeing a lot of like for example, Steven Crowder is not doing his stream all in July, and uh, these long streams obviously add to a lot of the watch time. Not him particularly, but uh, a lot of different creators that don't uh, create content over the summer. We also have moved uh, our, we're slowly moving over our uh, CDN onto our own CDN, and uh, from preliminary results that we're seeing is that our CDN is recording, it seems to have, uh, be recording less bandwidth than uh, the third-party CDNs that uh, we, uh, we used. Got it. So maybe MAU will be a better indicator than, than, than minutes, kind of, at least from a trending standpoint. Um, and then on ad monetization, um, I mean, is, is rack behind schedule? I mean, you know, given the, you know, um, the MAU being up sequentially, it was a little surprising to see, you know, kind of, particularly like the U.S. revenue or just the advertising revenue kind of down sequentially. So, um, I mean, maybe just like unpack that. I mean, sales and marketing was down, so was there like less manual selling effort maybe ahead of RAC? Just kind of why, why was revenue down sequentially? Because I just usually third quarter seasonally is, you know, isn't, isn't a smaller quarter than second quarter. And I'll do one. Yeah, no, absolutely. So when it comes to revenue, what we said in the second quarter is that uh, a lot of our revenue stems from the testing that we've done with a cohort of small cohort of creators on uh, on the sponsorship side, and we haven't at this point uh, fully scaled rack on the on the programmatic side. So there's two sides to the business at Rumble um, when it comes to the advertising. One is the sponsorship, rack, rack sponsorships, and the other one's gonna be rack programmatic. Uh, and, and right now we're, we're on schedule to be launching programmatic within our app uh, this quarter, uh, hopefully in, in a few weeks to like two to four weeks time. And uh, that will be you know, a big moment for us when we start introducing pre-rolls within app and should have, have an effect on revenue going into 2024. And then the second component is because we're only testing a small cohort of creators on the sponsorship side, we need to integrate that into Rumble Studio and Rack and deliver that early in 2024 so that people can get those sponsorships on scale with while they're going live on streaming. So I wouldn't say Rack is behind. In fact, I think we're, we're, we're you know, making history in the sense that we're building these tools in the last year that, you know, companies like Google took, you know, they bought DoubleClick for billions of dollars and built out their tools over like a decade. We're trying to compress that all in the last 365 days. So I think we're doing extremely well on, uh, on that, having Rack where it is right now and being ready to introduce pre-rolls for 2024 is uh, in our apps and OTT is a, is a big milestone for us and we're on target to be doing that. And then as we introduce uh, Rack into Rumble Studio, which just came out to in, into beta in the last couple of weeks, we still have to build the, the sponsorship part into the studio. Um, I think uh, we're, we're doing quite well on, uh, on building that out. So just to follow up and not to put words in your mouth, so was basically the sequential decline in, in advertising revenue more a function of that you had and be advertisers who tested the platform in the second quarter but did not come in in the third quarter? Or like just were you kind of shifting resources ahead of Rack and Rumble, uh, Rumble Studio launch? Yeah, I don't think it was a, it's the, it's an advertiser thing. I think it's more of a cohort of creators. If we have a small cohort of creators that we're monetizing very well and they're taking vacation during the summer, that's going to have an impact in addition to the fact that we are, you know, really trying to get Rack and the sponsorships and Rack and the studio and all that, all our focus is there as well. It's a combination of a few things and those are, those are at least two things that really contribute to it. Yeah, and then last one, I'll jump back in the queue. So gross margin 
loss was was a lot worse than the you know it's been getting worse right like this is you know third quarter of incrementally worse gross margin loss. Um, I mean obviously there's the revenue impact, but was there also kind of mix on content? Um, you know just the way um, you know licensing I believe I think has a low well. I mean, mix between revenue licensing versus advertising or other content. Maybe just help us unpack why gross the gross margin loss from a ratio standpoint was was kind of so much worse from the second quarter. Yeah. Hey, Jason, it's Brandon. So, cost of services, I think, was um, a little down, relatively flat to the to the prior quarter. And, and a, the biggest chunk of cost of services is the creator incentive costs, right? Which are the commitments that we've made and the minimum guarantees that we've been talking about, which will be coming off, as we said, at the end of you know at the end of 2024. That's when they'll be meaningfully coming down. So they'll they'll continue to to be in there um, for the next few quarters, and then that's when they start coming off. So that's um, that's just part of the business plan with respect to the commitments on the on the content acquisition strategy. Right, thanks. I'll jump back. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question is from Tom Forte with D. A. Davidson. Please go ahead. Great. So three follow-ups for me, and then I'll I'll stop. Um, so one at a time. Can you discuss what artificial intelligence means to Rumble and to what extent you're able to use the technology to enhance content moderation, uh, sorry, moderation on the platform? Yes. Uh, thanks, Tom. So when it comes to AI and uh, moderation, we've opted to stay away from that entirely. Um, it, I think those are the mistakes that the larger platforms have, have done is re relied on uh, a lot of technology to flag and remove content, uh, whereas uh, we, we want to be a little bit more particular about that and have real human eyes on something and not rely on something that isn't, hasn't, hasn't proved out to be 100% uh, uh, accurate. So when it comes to AI and the moderation side, we, we haven't implemented anything of that sort and uh, we have no current plans to, to implement anything of that sort. All right, and then second, this is very philosophical, but I like to get philosophical with you, Chris. All right, so uh, on AI, it seems to me there's a real risk that given the parties involved, advancement in AI is going to increase the excess influence on consumers from big tech, Amazon, Apple, Google, Meta Platforms, Microsoft, so um, I'd appreciate your thoughts on that as long-term participant, and then also what can you do, if anything, to disrupt that? Yeah, so at, at this point, um, when, when looking at AI and artificial intelligence on the Rumble side, the, obviously video is a massive contributor to, to AI models. Um, it's not something that we're doing, and it's not something that we're in. Uh, it, additionally, there, I think a first step for Rumble when it comes to any sort of machine learning or any sort of recommendations will be in terms of like making sure that we deliver content that people want um, after a video is done. We're not going to be uh, adopting a, a new feed based on AI not anytime soon, and you know uh, for a lot of various reasons. But when it comes to surfacing content and helping drive watch time, I, I think there there's things that we could do on the on the recommendation side, but. But I want to be very careful on how we do that and what we do just based on the, uh, w what we currently see and what our audience really wants. So I want to make sure we deliver what they want more than uh, what, what uh, other companies are doing. Excellent. Last question. Thanks for taking all my questions. So can you give your current thoughts on the regulatory efforts across the globe when it comes to the Internet broadly and free speech more specifically, including those in Canada? Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to obviously in, in the United States, there, the First Amendment is uh, is, is the most important uh, is is there. So it's a, it's critically important to us, and uh, obviously uh, you know puts a really big safeguard for for what we do. When it comes to other jurisdictions like France or China or North Korea, um, you know 
it, it's uh, it's obviously murky. Those aren't markets that uh, we're participating in. Uh, and when it comes to to Canada, obviously we're, we're hoping that things will change. Uh, in Canada, we're we're not really sure on how the laws in Canada will play out. So it's still a wait and see moment for us uh, in terms of uh, how they they will enforce and what they plan to enforce and what they plan to do. It's very early stage um, in Canada and, and along uh, and with many other markets. Um, but when it comes to the U.S., uh, that's kind of where our bread and butter is at, at this moment. And, uh, you know, we've challenged things and like in the New York State when they try to uh, push back on the First Amendment. And we have successfully, you know, we've been very successful there um, in, uh, in overturning that. And obviously now it's an appeal. Um, and we'll continue to, uh, it, we'll continue to uh, push forward on, on that in the United States alongside the First Amendment. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks for your questions. Thank you. Our next question is from the line of Jason Helfstein with Oppenheimer and Company. Please go ahead. Thanks. Oh, just a few more. So um, can you talk about um, what drove, um, I think, uh, hold on a second. Nope, I'm good on that question. Okay. So the next question um, how should we think about Rumble Cloud impact on either gross profit or EBITDA over the next 12 months? I mean, just like broadly, I mean, is this entirely just selling excess capacity? Are there going to be additional costs? Um, but it, it'll still be like accretive from a financial standpoint. Um, that one, and then I'll, I'll just do one more after that. Uh, yeah, we're not providing any guidance on the on cloud at this point. Okay, um, and then your comment about um, EBITDA break even in 25, is that for the full year of 25 or just like at a point in 25, like a quarter yeah. in 25? Just, just to clarify, so we haven't defined uh, what we mean by break even uh, at this time. It's, it's a, you know, there, there's disclosure requirements around that surrounding like non-GAAP metrics. And so, uh, you know, we'll develop the, the appropriate set of metrics around this and communicate that during 2024. Um, but at this time, we haven't defined it, nor are we giving guidance on the timing of that specifically. So, so but what was that comment, though? Like, you specifically said our goal is to be break even in 25. So, no, I think we said we're, we're heading. Yeah, we're, we're heading towards break even in 2025. As these expenses that I was mentioning earlier, as these creator commitment expenses start coming off and revenue starts to scale, that's when we start heading towards the break even uh, time frame, which we expect to happen in 2025. So, so basically, you mean you're trying to say that you will see an improvement, you know, in 2025, uh, like uh, as a marginal level, but there's no commitment to absolute levels at this point. There, uh, we expect we will be break even. We'll communicate more about what that means in 2024. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. As there are no further questions at this time, the conference of Rumble Inc. has now concluded. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines.